Uh, hello everybody and welcome to The Mayor and I, uh, a regular weekly po podcast that um, I, Lindsay Khan, do with Nick Buckley, MBE. Hello Nick. Um, and Nick Buckley is currently a, a parliamentary candidate for Oldham, East and Saddleworth. And we'll talk about a little bit about that, Nick, yep. today, along with other things. And we'll also cover a whole bunch of subjects that Nick and I, well, I tend to identify them and then Nick gives his <laughs> broad knowledge and opinion on them. So welcome. My job is to stop you going off on one. Yeah, we, yeah to stop me <laughs> get, going, becoming hysterical. Um, uh, so welcome, Nick Buckley, MBE. Thank you. Thank you. So before we start, on, there's, there's, quite, there's loads of news at the moment. Yeah. So before, before we start, maybe just a quick update on your campaign to be the MP for Oldham East and Saddleworth. Yeah, it's it's going fine, considering everything, as in snap election, yeah. no time to plan anything, no time to get loads of volunteers, but considering the situation we're in, it's going fine. Um, I've just got some ads going out now in the local newspaper, the Oldham Times, and I've got some ads going out online with the Oldham Chronicle, so hopefully that'll hit the right people in that area. Um, I've been doing some videos on the streets, speaking to normal yep, people. I've seen some of those. They've been going yeah. well on TikTok yeah. and Facebook and stuff. Um, and I got my first couple of votes yesterday that people took pictures of their postal vote with a cross Fantastic. next to my name. So oh, I've got brilliant. at least two votes. Yeah, that's good. To see. <laughs> um, how am I going to do 10 days from now? Um, I don't know. Again, I always start with a hope I don't embarrass myself and then we build from there. Um, I think it's an impossible task for an independent to win in six weeks. I think it still looks like a Labour safe seat, but that all depends on how well George Galloway party does. Because if he does well, it just takes all the way from Labour. Yes. The yeah. Tories have collapsed. Yeah. I've not met anyone in the area who've admitted voting, who are going to vote Tory. They either say they're going to vote reform, me, or I'm not voting at all. Yeah. So it's still up in the air, but we will see. It's nine days today. I think it could be interesting. And we're going to talk about uh, Lawrence Fox and Calvin Robinson later, who do a podcast called uh, Fox... Fox and the Father, I think yeah. it's called. But Lawrence Fox was saying that he thinks the impact of reform is going to be massive, far bigger than maybe people are thinking yeah. out there. I think what's, you just made a very interesting point, which I haven't thought about before. It's almost like now there are two, two parties that are draining votes from both sides of the political spectrum. So you have George Galloway's, uh, yeah. is it, what is it, the Workers' Party? Party of Britain, yeah. Is it called Party of Britain? I the, the Workers' Party of Britain. Workers' Party of Britain, which is draining support from Labour. Yeah. And you have reform that is, seems to be draining support from uh, the Tories, which mm. I hadn't really thought of before. That's quite interesting. Because mm. normally there's one party, whether it's, Bre whether it's uh, UKIP or whatever, draining support from the Tories. But now we've actually got something that's taking support from Labour. He's only taking support from Labour's in predominantly Muslim areas. Yes. And only in one or two of those areas. Nationally, he hasn't created the reach he was hoping to create. Yeah. He's lost momentum. You don't see much about him Correct. anymore now. You don't. Where reformer, the opposite reformer, really taken off. Yeah. George Galloway will damage the Labour Party in half a dozen seats he's been concentrating in. He'll damage them. Yeah. He may not even win his seat. Yeah. But he will damage Labour in the half a dozen seats he's concentrating on. Yeah. So you think reform are actually gaining ground? Then uh, You can see more. it on social media, really? you can see it yeah. on the news, you can see it by talking to people on the streets. They're gaining ground. How that translates to votes and how much does that translate to winning seats, I have no idea. Right. But lots and lots of people are telling me they're voting reform. Yeah. And I hope reform do well, yeah. apart from in my seat. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, I, I will be, uh, and I know you're not supposed to disclose it, I will be voting reform in um, Sale, I can't remember what they said, Trafford, some Trafford or, or yeah. whatever it's called. Some, I don't know what I Change the boundaries called. and change the names, yeah. I'm never really sure. Um, <clears> it's <throat> predicted to be a Labour win, but I don't care because I think my vote is to register the fact that yep. the people need an alternative. And I, I, I want to see my vote in the overall national reform mm. vote. To give it a, to, to let, send a message yep. basically. 
But let's not talk too much about reform because we spent the entire last episode talking about reform. And all those videos did really well online. Yes, they did. And there was one video because there was you've had two videos recently that, and I have a look every now and then see how they're doing. Two recently have done really well. Yeah. One was about Tommy Robinson yeah. and about that march. Like about was three it? and a half thousand views, which yeah. is a lot for us. And this one you're talking about to do with, Nar- I can't remember what it was, and Nigel Farage has done over 4,000... 4.2 thousand... Votes. Uh, uh, sorry, views. views. Yeah. And, and what was that one about? I think that was... It was about the manifesto, so it was one bit of their manifesto. Yeah, it was about one bit of the manifesto. Yeah. It's amazing why... That does excellent, but the others do yeah. two hundred views. Yeah, yeah, and it's the same topic. It's just, yeah, it's just strange sometimes. And and both that <laughs> one and the Tommy Robinson had a lot of comments. I think like nearly a hundred yeah, yeah, people yeah. commenting on yeah. it and pushed General, up, and pushed up subscribers. Your subscribers. I yeah. think we've got an extra eighty subscribers since last week. Fantastic. And yeah. it never dropped. It might get one or two in a week. Yeah, yeah, a dozen in a week. Yeah, never ate it. So. Wow. That's down to those videos. Yeah. And most of the comments are generally positive, I think. Yeah. Every, every now and then you'll see a comment. 99% like, comment. Um, like, positive. two old racists and things like that. Yeah. And, 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 and we got one the other day, uh, directed at me. Uh, I think it was the one where we're talking about reforms, policy on the armed forces. And the comment was, to me, the, the, the only time you've been fighting is to get to, get to the front of the buffet. <laughs> that's not very nice. That, that's 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 quite quite, quite funny. <laughs> it was funny. Actually, quite funny, yeah. That's... And the week before, the funny one, the week before was um, you speak you speak like a baby with no teeth. All right. That one made me laugh as well. <laughs> um. So so that so yeah so so there is obviously a lot of interest in that reform. However, this week we're not going to talk about reform or much politics at all. We're going to cover. <laughs> A bunch of things I've been seeing over the last few weeks that I think are just very, very interesting mm. and would like your views and opinions on. And I want to start with something that probably our, our gentle viewers may not even know about, which is to do with a meta- phenomenon, phenomenon in America at the moment. And it's a lady, a proper lady, called Caitlin Clark, who is an American basketball player. And she is phenomenal, apparently. She is the, the female equivalent of... Uh, Michael Jordan, no. I'm sure you've heard no. of, or, or uh, LeBron, um, yeah. LeBron, LeBron James. James. LeBron James. Um, <clears throat> but the interesting thing about Caitlin Clark is she, she's white and heterosexual. So 70% of the WNBA, which is a Women's yeah. National Basketball Association, are black. And apparently, and I don't know how, I don't know what how they get this stat, most of those are lesbians. Mm. But Caitlin Clark is, you know, she's an attractive, <clears throat> very photogenic, White, she's six foot tall, uh, uh, basketball player. And what's interesting is she has been pilloried by the rest, by a significant number of her colleagues in the WNBA. Mm. So she, was, she was top of the college uh, uh, circuit and then she's coming to the WNBA, one of the highest ever paid players coming in there. But she has had a hell of a lot of negative mm. uh, comments about her, about her not deserving her place, about her being this, that and the other, and mainly from black uh, female WNBA players. Um, And I I, I wanted to ask you about this because I was looking at it and I was thinking, this is outrageous, this is racism or whatever. But then I kind of thought, isn't this what happened 20 or 30 years ago to black players coming into predominantly white sports in the USA? Or, Or is this something slightly different? I think it's different, but the same. Yeah. So the point you made there is completely correct. So 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago in America, black players coming through in any sport would have received a hostile environment. Um, Down to racism, down to fear of the unknown, down to we're better than you, we don't want to play with black people, we're, we're a better race than you. Many, many things would have contributed to that. There was no women's sports in those days, so this would have been male sports coming through. What's different with this one is it's universally acknowledged now in the West that racism is wrong. So nobody consciously would be saying we don't want her playing because she's white. Even they don't believe that, even though subconsciously they may. 
they wouldn't consciously think that and definitely wouldn't say that. Part of it is because it's a woman's sport and women are more catty um, and, and they're more jealous than men. Um, you laugh, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, women will tell you that about, about each other and themselves. Um, that doesn't mean men can't be jealous. And, you know, one of my favourite quotes of all time is from Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan said, it's not enough that I should win, but that everybody else should lose. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, these are human traits. What else is on top of this, the racism part of it as well, is there's a f there's a feeling, from what I've read, I've only read a little bit, what do I care about basketball? What do mm. I care about mm. women's basketball? Mm. Nothing. But from what I read coming out to me, there seems to be a little bit of black basketball players saying this game's ours mm, yes we're not scientists yeah we're not this we're not that yeah. we don't do anything else well sport is what we do yeah. and especially basketball sport is what we do how dare this white woman come yeah. along and yeah. be better than us yeah and in fact she isn't better than us she's only perceived to be better because she's white yeah she's only attracting the money because she's Correct. white. That's what they're saying. They're saying yeah. oh, her stats don't measure up. But, uh, and they're, yeah. they're making up... I've seen uh, a black <laughs> female ex-player making up statistics about saying she's you know, 25 years old, so she's actually 21, Caitlin Clark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And her stats are way above yeah. any previous incumbent. Of, of now, these black athletes have a point to a certain extent. Yeah. I'm sure she's getting paid more and getting more attention because she is white. I'm yeah. sure that's part of it. Yeah. Just like the Venus... William Venus sisters in tennis yeah, yeah. got more attention when they started coming through because they, they were, were black. black. Yeah. Um, the golfer Tiger Woods yeah. got more attention coming yeah. through because he was black. Yeah. Once he became a phenomenal player and what, then he was getting attention because of who he was. Yeah. So I'm sure she's getting some extra attention because she's white and the people paying her will be looking at marketing and uh, viewing figures and they're going we have a potential star here because she's white because she's good as yeah. well as being white yeah this might bring a whole new load of white girls into the yeah. game that means more money so i'm sure there's a bit of that going on because yeah. this is a business at the end of the yeah. day yeah but the way they've reacted to it is racist yeah and pure jealousy yeah and the women's basketball in america makes no money mm. it's completely subsidized by the male teams yes because they don't earn enough money to even pay their way yeah it's heavily subsidized by male teams because, but, but because no one watches it but caitlin clark is generating revenues lots and, of people are watching and the that's why there, but she's filling yeah. stadiums people want to see yeah. her People, and, and, people want to see the stars. That's why yeah. we have Ronaldo's Correct. and Messi's, yeah. Mike Tyson's, David Beckham's. They may not be the best players in the world all their career because they're not. Yeah. But they still well, have. Ronaldo is, but anyway, they still that's... have star quality. Yeah. They still bring yes. money into the game. They still fill stadiums. Yeah. So even when they're beyond, even when they've not reached their top or gone beyond the top and are on the way down. Yeah. It's a biz. Sports a business. Yeah. And, and I think what's interesting and I. This section I called it the curious case of Caitlin Clark. What's interesting is the fact she's white is mm. now unusual. That's what's that's one of the bizarre things that's attractive about her in the sport because she is white and, and good. Grown, so so it's it's completely shifted round now where <coughs> being black and good in a sport became was an interesting thing. Mm. Now. If you're white and good at that sport, it's actually that itself is attractive to people. Not not for racism reasons, just because she's unusual in that way. That, it is, but this is the left eating itself again. So the left have been telling us for decades about representation. Yeah. I've got to see me in a business. I've got to see me in a team to support that team. Yeah. I've got to see so basketballs, like say seventy percent black. White kids are going I don't see myself in that team. Yeah. I now, I'm, they don't do that. Yeah. I, you can see a hero in anybody. Yeah. It's their actions that make him a hero and then you relate to that. You don't have to see a white person as a white person to see that as a hero. You can see someone like Gandhi, see someone like um, Martin Luther King. You see these people as heroes. Yeah. 
Not because you're the same colour. Not because of my colour, yeah. Because of their because actions. Of the person, yeah. So they're left saying we have to see representation has backfired now because Caitlin, Caitlin, whatever she's Clark, Clark, can say, well, I'm representing 85, no, I'm representing 70% of the American girls because I'm white. Yes. All well, the bollocks, and that yeah. doesn't work like yeah. that. Yeah. But you can use a leftist argument They can't them. argue against it, no. can they? That, that's <coughs> because what's really fascinating. Because representation matters. And, and you've raised an interesting point here, which I hadn't thought about before. It's not just the fact that we're 70% black and it's our sport or whatever. You've made a very good point as well, which you know may not go down well with, with all our viewers, that in terms of achievement, the, the a lot of the areas where the black people have achieved has been things like sport and entertainment. Other areas they are not particularly successful mm -hmm. in. And this is a situation where a white person is now invading an area where they've actually shown preeminence and potentially, you know, dominating that, that area. So mm -hmm. it must be threatening, I guess. It is. To it, that society, to that if, group. If you've bought into identity politics, yeah. you can see it being a huge insult. Yeah. I thought my group were the best at this. Yeah. What are you doing yeah. challenging my group? Yeah. I'm a black yeah. female lesbian. Yeah. We're the best at this. Yeah. Well, no, you're not. Yeah. Because for you, for black, lesb for black female lesbians to be the best at something means it's, and in in innate trait. Yeah. No, we don't have innate traits like that. Yeah. Because if we do, then we can start putting other labels on people for their traits. That's racism. Yeah. When you look at someone and go, because of your this, that means you like these things and dislike that's yeah. racism. I mean, isn't isn't it in a way a positive thing for black people that this is happening? Because I know as well that that within the world of sprinting, which was dominated by black runners, there are now some quite a few white runners. I don't know if you're aware of this. No. There's quite a few white runners coming through who are fast, fast runners, basically. But I would have thought, isn't this a positive thing for black people? Because rather than being labelled, well, black people are only good at, at sports because mm. of genetics or whatever, that's the only reason yeah. you're good at it. You're actually finding now, if you've got white athletes coming through in these sports, it kind of removes that stereotype that black people are only good at sport because of their physical makeup or whatever. Is that not a positive thing for them to see? Or I would argue it's a positive thing. I think this is a negative thing to discuss for these individuals because this will lead, after one or two small steps, to discussion around IQ in race. Right. That's yes. where this leads to. Yes, yeah. And scientifically, we should have those discussions and see what's relevant there. Yeah. But... It will be, it will be perverted quite quickly by people going, my race is better than your race. Yeah. Because that that's what those black female athletes have already said. They're saying that already. In that yeah. context, yeah. my race is better than your race yeah. when we play basketball. Yeah. Again, racism, and along that line is my race is more intelligent than your race. Yeah. Um, they need to be. Re this is just female jealousy. Yeah. You rarely get men doing this in sports. Yeah. There, there because was men, because men, a men on the whole, of a better sense of fair play, but not all of them. But then, if you did this as a male athlete, you'd be laughed at. Yes. Stop being weak. If yeah. you don't like him, beat him on the track and field. Yeah. Score more yeah. points than him. Score more goals than him. Stop being a moaning, envious little girl. Yeah. And actually, that is the way men... T I would say in men's football, that's the way it is. The way they try and prove their point is by beating... <laughs> Their opponent. So you're, so you're on a way to win? Yeah, it is. You can say what you want, but if I score more goals than you, no matter what you say is worthless. Yeah. Very interesting. I, I, I just thought it was a fascinating phenomenon hap happening now. And you're right, what's, what that's going to do is attract lots more young white girls back into basketball, I guess. More seats on bums. Yes. More money coming in. Yeah. All those players get paid more. Yeah. Even the black female lesbians. Yes. So it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about progressive um, left wingers, um, there was a nauseating advert done by celebrities in America. Ju Julie, Julia, Julia Morris. I can't remember the one. She, she was in Hannibal. Um, yeah, I can't remember. She's got red hair. Yeah, but but not just Ju her. Julianne Moore. Julianne Moore, yes. And then there was string. You know your celebrities, obviously. Yeah. I, I watched it the other day. Yeah. So. And there were a string of nauseating yeah. celebrities saying, don't let this guy get in, it'll ruin democracy. Talking about Trump, uh, Trump and saying, vote, vote Biden. 
um, including one who appeared to be in tears all the way through. The, I mean, it was just sickening to watch, really. Yeah. And I don't even know why I watched it, but I did watch it to, to the bit. I think Mark Ruffalo was in there, who's, yeah. in the, who's a notorious left-wing arsehole, basically. Yeah. So, so progressive arsehole. He's so, done some good films. But he's done some good films, which is what they should stick to. I actually, disp- the reason I hate seeing film actors doing this stuff is it destroys their canon of films for me, yeah. you know, so I don't want to know what their political views are. I almost don't want to know because I don't want to spoil the films. Because one of my favourite films is Hannibal with Julianne Moore. Mm. But now every time I watch it, I'll just think of that nauseating answer. Anyway, what was funny about this is Ricky Gervais then did a video and he literally just did it in his bath as yeah. far as I can see, I holding his phone. Um, and it's, he started off by saying, hi, I'm a celebrity and I know stuff. And then went on to say, <laughs> so when I tell you to vote, I mean, it was a superb parody, yeah. really. But basically just saying, and, and, it, and it's, it's totally correct, isn't it? You know, celebrities do this, and, but, what, but why would we and why should we listen to these imbeciles doing this? Ricky Gervais is right when he's doing that, that mocking mm-hmm. of it. Uh, these the, these celebrities coming on and telling why why should we listen to them and why do we listen to them but people do listen mm. to them don't they Nick so so why do people because don't they understand that these are just actors they're just not particularly high IQs most of these people they you know most of them spent most actors have low IQs go to Hollywood never get a job and never make it in in <laughs> films there's a very very small percentage who mainly through luck mm. end up getting to have good careers. Yeah. And then once they get these careers, they then launch into these behaviours. Uh, and why don't they just shut up, Nick? What, what, what's going on here? I've said this to you before. When you enter a room, if you don't know who the idiot in the room is within a few seconds, it means you're the idiot. And that goes well with celebrities. The reason why good actors are good actors is because they have no personality themselves. They are vacuous, empty vessels which take on the persona of what someone else has written in a script and they take that on board and they, like a chameleon, pretend to be that. That's what makes them good actors. You get some actors who basically play themselves in every film. The Rock, for instance. Yeah. He plays himself in every film because he's not an actor. Mm. He's an entertainer. He came mm. from wrestling. He plays himself. But most actors play what's written on the paper and don't have any personality themselves. Once they become famous, they then think that they're more special, they're treated special. They think they're intelligent for being able to do what they do. Where in fact, it's actually a personality not trait, it's a personality, it's a minus personality trait. Mm. The fact you haven't got personality yourself and you've got to take on other people's personalities mm. to earn a living. And then they think there's something they're not. And they're treated like that by everybody. So they then begin to think, I'm someone special here. You should take notice of celebrities just as much as you should take notice of your mechanic, your electrician, your dustbin man. You take all those opinions on board. I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to them. Take them all on board because they're all equally valuable or all equally loaded of rubbish. Mm. So um, Ricky Gervais killed him saying that. And Ricky Gervais has been doing this for a decade now, if not longer, at the award ceremonies when he just takes the mickey out of them all because he knows you're nothing special. Mm. And most of these people were friends with um, the pervert who died on his... Who went, Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein. Yeah. The, uh, the producer who was raping... Oh, Harvey, Weinstein, Harvey so, Weinstein. So these yeah. people are friends with all yeah. these people and, and sucked up to them when they're in power and everybody knew what was going on. Yeah. Um, but no one said anything then. It's easy to talk about things when you think everybody else agrees with you. Yeah. Um, and when you get some virtue signaling points. Going online, going... Trump's a Nazi, please don't vote for Trump. There's no downside for you. Mm. Go online and say, we need we need a death penalty for paedophiles. Well, you wouldn't get any brownie points for that, but I'd take my hat off if you did that as a slip it. There's certain things, they'll only talk about things where there's no risk to them. Yeah. And that's the annoying me. Yeah. The, they, they start to believe they make these statements, but they, they, they talk as though they have some special insight 
into <laughs> into politics, and they have no yeah. insight. They have no more insight than the bloke on the street yeah. into politics. Or, but they believe somehow they start to believe that they have insight, don't they? Yeah. And that's the point Ricky Gervais made, didn't he? I'm an actor. I'm, I'm a celebrity, and I know stuff. But yeah. I automa- automatically yeah. start to believe they all have a, a far greater insight. Yeah into politics and what's going on than you and I do. Mm. Therefore, I'm going to go on to an, and, and actually tell you yeah. what you need to do. Because everybody validates what they're saying. Yeah. So they think, I, I am, in t- I am yeah. amazing because everyone tells me. Yeah. yeah. There was a Roman emperor called Marcus Aurelius. Yes. Who, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but the from what I've heard this, history yeah. books say, he employed someone to walk behind him in the street because he was loved by the crowds. He was like a living god. Um, and he paid someone to walk behind him to whisper in his ear, "You are just a man." Yes. You are just. You're a only man. human. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've heard that. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think it is true. I don't think it's apocryphal. I've heard that about him. Um, <clears throat> this. This. We're talking again about. We've talked already about Caitlin Clark about Ricky Gervais comments. The idea that the idea now of what we call victim culture. That we we that, that people like celebrities try to engender in people the idea that they are victims or people are victims or they're a vi- even you get lots of actors now who are incredibly successful, have a fantastic life, come on come on to shows telling people how they you know they'd had an abusive childhood and been victims yeah. and all this sort of stuff. And I've noticed usually this, when they're selling a book. Usually when they're selling a book, yes, to, to get those numbers up. But what I've noticed here is in this current, and I know say we're going to talk about reform, but I'm going to talk about UK politics. We're seeing this now spilling into politics, and particularly in the Labour part. Well, in fact, Rishi Sunak tried to do it, but didn't do a very good job. But Keir Starmer keeps droning on about his toolmaker dad, to the point where he came onto a, um, came onto a pres- debate, a debate. And when he said about his toolmaker, the audience were, in, were, were laughing and, in, and he got annoyed because he thought they were <laughs> mocking the idea that his father was had a lowly job as a toolmaker. But what they were in fact laughing at was the fact it's so pathetic. He constantly references his toolmaker dad as if to engender in people, oh, we must vote for him because his dad was a toolmaker. So that's one of the things we've seen. The second thing is... Uh, Rain, uh, what's the Rain? Angela Rayner. Angela Rayner, who I, I, I find a, a, a classist. A, a, a part, yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Well, part of the problem is she can't string a sentence together. <laughs> yeah. And as somebody with very poor grammar, yeah. automatically scores no points. And she's not a nice person as well. She comes across as not yeah. a nice person. And she's been exposed in the in the debates because she's been robotic in her mm. responses. And at one point, she referenced the fact she had had to have free school meals and she had to queue behind the other kids because. You know, she. I mean, she's she's a monstrous woman. She's about six foot tall. She can't have done that badly on barging away to the front and the free school meals. Not like me. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Always first at the front of the buffet line. Um, uh, so this this behaviour, this victim thing, which is now spilling into sit. You don't want. I mean, you, my view is you don't want your politicians to present themselves as victims. You want your politicians you, you, to present. You think so? You, yeah. yeah. So, so, so what's happening, what's happen- and, and in tandem with this, at the same time as we were seeing this, that some stats came out showing that one million people since COVID have now signed on to universal credit uh, as a result of mental health problems. So, mm. so what, what is going on here? You, I know you've talked about yeah. this before, haven't the, you? Yeah, let's but it's start. now spilling into the senior, who is going to be our future yeah, Prime yeah, Minister? Yeah. The Rishi Sunak one, um, what was his example again? Sky TV. He didn't have Sky TV when he was yeah, a kid. Yeah, exactly. But that's, so what, <laughs> what, what they're all trying to do is to relate to the average person on the street. We've made being a victim trendy and valuable. So everybody, not everybody, most people, a lot of people want to be a victim. Because A, that stops you having to address your mistakes and correct your life. Because how can I correct my life when people do these things to me? It's not my fault I'm poor, I'm unemployed, I'm stupid, I'm fat, I'm lazy. It's because of racism, it's because of fat phobia, it's because of transism. If someone gives you a gold-plated excuse, 
then why would you do the hard work and the heavy lifting to improve yourself and improve your life? And if you believe that, and most people do believe into it, then why would you try because you already know the cards are stacked against you? So you wouldn't do anything about it. The tool maker one, really good example of politicians not understanding the common person. When he says, my dad was a tool maker, I go, yeah, and you're the tool he made. <laughs> How his advisors didn't, couldn't see that joke in that phrase. He should have said, my dad was a mechanic. My dad worked in a factory. To say oh, is that why people are laughing? I think so. Because they're saying you're the tool. You're the tool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my dad's a tool maker. Yeah, well, he did make a tool, didn't he? You. <laughs> but the fact he didn't get that, and no one's ever got that. Yeah. And I'm not saying you didn't get it. So I'm not saying most people get it. I'm just saying a significant part of the yeah. population get that job. I see. Now, I if you dig that, deeper yeah. in this, yeah. his dad wasn't a tool maker. His dad owned the factory where tools were made. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yes, his dad owned the factory that made tools. So he's a liar. That, not a liar. He just is very clever with the wording. That's why he never changes that phrase. Yeah. Because he thinks if I change the phrase, it might make me a liar. Right. So I might slip up and change it and then, oh, no. So he sticks to that phrase. His, his dad isn't what we thought he was. When you say my dad was a tool maker, I imagine you at a lathe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bits of iron yeah, filings of and, that's what I think, and yeah. don't yeah. get, no, no, no. His dad owned the factory. Oh, really? So, so that's all in the press. That's not me making this up. Um, Angela Rayner, my, I queued up for free school dinners. Well, you might have done, but that's irrelevant. Yes. Because the is. fact you did that, and I did that on my schooling as well. I wrote about it in my first book. Yeah. Um, because when I queued up, I stood there with my, and we queued up at break time on the Monday to get five tickets for the rest of the week. Yeah. And we queued up at the admin office. Everybody knew that was the queue for the poor kids. And um, we stood up, we queued up, and I stood there saying to myself, well, this is okay. I don't mind. You know, my family's poor. I need, you know, I need a dinner. Yeah. That's fine. But I'll tell you what, my kid won't be stood in the queue like this. Yeah. yeah. That's what it did to me. It, it was a queue. motivator. Yeah. It, it wasn't me going... How dare they make me stand in this queue? Well, I am poor. I know I'm poor. Yeah. And the foot people now know I'm poor. Then what do I? What do I care? But you know something. <laughs> I I don't remember, and and I don't. I think my school meals were paid for. I can't remember how it worked yeah. when I was school. But I don't remember the free school meals. Kids being in a separate line no, or no. be delineated against on no, the. It was a. Free, it was another line. To pick up your free, your, your vouchers. five vouchers. But once you had your voucher, that was it. You're in yeah. with everybody else. Yeah. It didn't make any. It wasn't like no, no, no. I don't remember a separate table with free school meals. Well, or the, no. the the kids who were on free school meals. Yeah. And I'm sure there were. There must have been. Yeah, like, I went to comprehensive schools. Yeah. Um, I don't remember them being particularly delineated. Or, no, they just or, would have queued up. Yeah. The first, the first break, the ten o'clock half ten break on the Monday. Yeah. They'd have spent their fifteen minute break queuing up. Outside the head's office to get their to get their tickets. five tickets, yeah. and that would have been it for the yeah. week. Yeah. So, um, so let's get back to it. So, yeah. So, so Angela Rain accused. It up. was not her fault that she was poor. That was her parents' fault. Yeah. yeah. So, not her fault. Yeah. And then from that, she's done well in life. Mm. She's now the deputy leader of the Labour Party, and going to be deputy prime minister. Yeah. Potentially so, a future prime minister. Potentially. So, yeah. so queuing up and being on free school meals didn't do her any harm. No. So th that's. But what she's trying to signal there to the poor people and Labour Party is, I'm just like you. Yeah. I'm just like you. I own several houses now and I don't pay tax when I sell my house, by the way. And I'm using all my expenses to buy iPhones and iPods and all. But I'm just like you when I was a kid. I was just a bit better than you because look where I finished. That's yeah. what she's saying to yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And none of this plays with me at all. No. Because none of this as a child had anything to do with you. It was Do you just, think it plays with anybody? That I, I think I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's really? like, oh yeah, I can relate to it. She relates to me. She knows what it's like to be poor. Ricky Sunak uh, is a billionaire. How can he relate to me? And these are the games of identity politics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my greatest prime ministers ever, Winston Churchill, was never poor. No. Um, lived in a palace. No. And he didn't pretend to be anything he wasn't either. No, because those days he didn't have to. So we just need to be careful that we don't, and we're doing that already, we don't start rewarding 
traits that are no use to leaders. Yes. Having yeah. a trait in a leader that I used to be poor. Well, who cares? It's not, it wasn't I, your fault. I think that's a really important point. I, I don't want to be led by somebody who I don't <laughs> think is particularly good or capable or what, what mm. did you know what I mean? I want to be led by somebody I think is brighter than me, uh, is quicker than me, is, you know, is politically more astute than me, mm. has knowledge. The problem, you, I mean, you all say I'm a classist about Angela Rayner. She does. She can't string a sentence together. I'm not a class. I'm sorry. I'm not classist, Nick. I'm thickest. If I think somebody's thick and I think she's thick as two short planks, I don't want that person being my prime minister or my deputy prime minister. I want bright people. I get that. But I think you, you've judged part of your judgment is on her accent and the way she speaks. No, I, I don't think that's right. Well, only I, some of your no, judgment. No, no, is yeah. On that. Okay. So one of my favourite. Um, the best player, one of my favourite playwrights is, um, I forgot his name now, flipping it, because uh, I'm under the spotlight. <laughs> He's a Yorkshire playwright. Alan, um, he wrote The History Boys. Uh, you know, red hair. Your, anyway, he's from Yorkshire. Yeah. He's got a very strong Yorkshire accent. Went to Oxford, Cambridge. Highly, highly intelligent, articulate. Yeah. Still a very strong accent, Yorkshire yeah. accent. I think he's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but he went to Oxford, Cambridge. He did go to Oxford, Cambridge. Yeah. And the second you know that, then you, your classism goes. No, no, because when he talks and the quality of his work is so high, I know he's mm. an intelligent guy, and I fully respect, and he's got a very strong Yorkshire mm. accent. But but I, I don't really mind, mm. so I'm, I'm not. She, she's easy to dislike I'll, I'll because of things she said one. and the way she presents herself. Um, but we, you're right. We don't need leaders being elected because they're the biggest victims. I don't want victims leading us. I want victors leading yes. us. Yes. If any of the uh, <laughs> listeners can tell me who the name of that Yorkshire playwright is, it would be appreciated. I, I will remember after this has finished. Um, talking about playwrights and plays. Alan Bennett. Alan Bennett. Now he is, I was thinking Alan Bates. And Alan Bennett. Yeah. But Alan Bennett has got a very strong accent. He's, you know, he celebrates being working class. Yeah. Uh, but I really respect him because he's got a phenomenal brain. A mm. phenomenal brain. Um, so yeah, but Angela Rayner, yeah, she, she's got the, the Yorkshire action. She can't get her grammar right. And she just comes across as thick as two short planks in my view, in my allegedly, I'm going to be careful what I say. <laughs> um, talking about playwrights, um, I know you're a big Seinfeld fan. Yeah. Um, and I was reading something about Seinfeld and I really thought it had passed. I said I wasn't going to mention it before. Was, Seinfeld is a sick American sitcom from the 90s. Yes, yeah, sorry for our, our gentle and, listeners who uh, I'm sure don't watch American sitcoms from that. It's quite a famous uh, It didn't really sitcom. do well over here. It never really played much over here. I think it did. You think it didn't? No. Oh. You could get it over here, but it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It was never a prime time show here. Never, it never didn't translate well. I thought it was excellent. It actually transformed comedy because it was the first... Because when we were very young, and you're a lot younger than me, uh, Nick, but when we were very young, a lot of the comedy shows we watched were things like The Cosby Show mm. and different... And it, they were very kind of moralistic. Yeah. Uh, Sweet and sickly. Yeah, and they would send a little message at the end <coughs> about you've got to love this or whatever. Yeah. Then Seinfeld came along and the ca central characters were... Seinfeld himself, Jerry yeah. Seinfeld, who played himself in uh, 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 George Costanza. Yeah. None of them were very nice. Yeah, and they're all they're all selfish, yeah. self obsessed, and really every show was about them doing something for their own self interest, yeah. Yeah. and generally it backfired. Maybe that was a message yeah, in yeah, it, yeah. basically. But even when things did backfire and things went horribly wrong, they always ended up being happy and carrying on with yeah, their yeah. lives. And they never realised it was all down to them. They yeah. never realised it's down, down to them. And apparently, one of the I was reading about the, the actual guys who wrote it, and one of their the dictum, the writing dictum, famous dictum, um, for the writers that Jerry Seinfeld said they had to follow was yeah. no hugging and no learning, basically. Yeah. And and that, if you think about it, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. there is no, <laughs> there is no hugging yeah. and there's no learning. You don't you, there's no little moral message yeah. rammed down your throat in Seinfeld. You know they. they I mean, there's one, there was one episode where I think uh, George was was going to get married and he yeah. kept waiting. He was hoping that his wife would die so he wouldn't have, his fiance would yeah. die so he wouldn't have to marry her. I think he tried to poison her. Anyway, it was all... She it was, he buys the cheapest 
envelopes for the wedding invitation. That's it, yes. And they were off the market and he got them really cheap online. And they're off the market because the glue was poison. Yes. And he makes her do them all. And because she's licked 3,000 envelopes, she dies of this poison. She died of poison. <laughs> but, but rather than being upset, he was thrilled that he yeah. managed to get out. Out of the wedding. So it was that kind of humour, which is just superb humour. <clears throat> and in a way, I think I think there's parallels to reform here, because I think reform is saying, no hugging, no learning here, guys. We, we get back to, to basically looking yeah. after ourselves, not being constantly mollycoddled yeah. or whatever and we get out there and start looking after Britain and ourselves basically I think I think that's the, that is kind of their message and it's kind of stepping away from oh let's be kind and all that yeah. there's yeah. none of this be kind crap it's like this is the reality this is the reality of our situation these are the very clinical clear things we have to do you know the, and, and it's not about being kind to immigrants or whatever it's yeah. about looking after us our and that's what Seinfeld was about it's yeah. about self self-interest what could they do to promote and progress themselves? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, is there? I think they found a real niche reform in this. And the niche is treat the voter like adults. Stop having opinion groups work out the best way of phrasing that policy to make it pink and fluffy. And they've gone, no, we're a bit like me. We're just going to go that's it yeah clear simple as few yeah. words as possible no fancy words so no one gets confused or or, or, or misunderstand no this is what we're doing yeah. bang 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 yeah. bang bang yeah. and i hope the voter likes that and appreciates that because what they're doing is they're treating the voter as an adult yes we're not having to make it pink and fluffy we're not trying to hide anything from you under fancy words and the different agenda we're telling you what needs to be done and how it's going to be done and then you've got the information and you need to vote on that or not yeah yeah and we're missing that we've missed that for decades now i Thatcher think, was the last person to do that i think you should have that <laughs> as a strap line under your campaign nick buckley mba no hugging no learning basically my phrase that i've been using for, dec for a good decade now is no more pink and fluffy that's good that's been that's my good. mantra no more pink and fluffy yeah and, and I think you're right, it's gone on too long. So every single statement that the other parties make has to be qualified by being inclusive of this or that yeah. or the other. And they can't ever just say, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, so, you know, even their things on immigration are qualified by this or that or the, yeah. and actually what reform are doing is saying, look, this is it, black and white, this is what we're going to do. And it, whatever. And yeah. people, you know, there will be, there will be casualties around that but they're saying in terms of the greater good this is the yeah. way we go isn't this some good examples would be you can't talk about islamic terrorism in this country without going and we need to be careful of the far right yes no, yeah the far right won't kill anybody yeah. one person in the last decade yeah that mp got killed um you can't talk about benefit fraud without then saying yeah, but lots of, lots of people need it. And yeah, they're, they're, yeah. They're, they've always got to qualify what they say. Well, so when they, they talk about them. Islamic terrorists, they say, but of course, let's remember that uh, the majority of Muslims are, are peaceful, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. They, they always qualify everything, don't they? Yeah. Rather than saying, we need to be watch out for Islamic yeah. terrorism. What's wrong with yeah. saying that? Yeah. Well, worse than that, they then talk about far right terrorism, which yes. doesn't exist. Yeah, correct. So why are you bringing another problem into the mix when that problem doesn't exist. Yes, correct. I'm sure there's some far right people in the country, but I reckon we could fit him in this room. Yeah, they're, 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 they're nothing like the force they were in the 70s. No, exactly. They're flaccid, they're broken, they're not yeah. anything like, they're no threat yeah, exactly. at all to, exactly. to society. But every time we talk about a series, no, we talk about ending the illegal boats across the channel. And every time we talk about the illegal boats, what we end up talking about is the evil people smugglers. Yes, yeah. I don't think the people smugglers are evil. I think they're business opportunities. Yeah. The people want to get across the channel and are willing to pay someone to take them across the channel. So they take them. They're not evil. They're not killing people and stealing people and shipping across the channel. But they've got to qualify illegal immigrants crossing the channel with. But it's not their fault. It's these illegal people smugglers. It's just rubbish all the time. Yeah. And because they mix it all up, we can, we never then get to address the real issue. Yes. Because they've just put a fog over everything. Yes. And now we're not sure what is the problem. Is it the illegal immigrants? Yeah. Government saying it's the people smugglers. Yeah. What's and it's like? Well, no, no. Let's just deal with the problem. That's really interesting, isn't it? You're right. We start talking about Islamic terrorism. We end up talking about the far right. Yeah. And it's like nothing to do with what we originally started the subject <laughs> yeah. on. 
because because that's a classic uh, that's a classic um, response when people start talking about Islamic terrorism on Question Time, where they'll say yes, blah blah blah. However, we have to be careful, and then they end up talking about the yeah. far right, and we don't actually deal. And it's a way of them avoiding talking about. Islamic terrorism. It's because you can get yourself into trouble, a slip of the tongue talking about yeah. Islamic terrorism. Yeah. You could have a million slips of the tongue talking about the far right. Nobody cares. Yeah. Um, you can get yourself into trouble talking about poor asylum seekers escaping war torn countries going across the channel and we call them illegal immigrants. A slip of the tongue there, you're in trouble. Yeah. You can say what you want about evil people smugglers, slip yeah. your tongue all day long. Yeah. No one cares. And you're right, they're deflecting, constantly deflecting. Onto and a subject that I won't get myself into trouble for. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. Of course, it's, it's, it's easy territory to head into, isn't it? Mm. Then they'd have to make any commitment or decision yeah. around which... <laughs> and we're back to politicians again, yeah. aren't we? The and then politicians. they can make the commitments that mean nothing. We're, we're going to clamp down on the evil people smugglers. Yes. Well, that's not the problem. You could invest a thousand of them today. They'll all be replaced tomorrow because yeah. you're making millions at this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Distraction technique. You mentioned pink and fluffy. Something I, I read um, <laughs> the other day, <laughs> and and I, I to be to be honest, I was frankly quite shocked, Nick. Um, and it's I'm getting harder to shock as I'm getting, <laughs> getting older. It was an article in the paper. And I think it was in, it might have been in the Times or the Telegraph. It wasn't in like the Daily Mail online thing. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a lady was complaining about the fact, I think she said I'd had to go without food because she had a hamster. So you know what hamsters are, don't yeah. you? Gentle, gentle listeners. Hamsters are very small, like mice-like creatures. Yeah, it's a and Freddie Starr ate one <laughs> once, just as a matter of interest. Yeah, someone else did something else with one. <laughs> I don't want to. As we know, Nick's always first in the buffet uh, line. <laughs> Um, so she had a hamster who had a problem with a tooth. A hamster, hamster had a problem with the tooth. She took it to the vet. It cost her five hundred pounds to get the tooth fixed. Mm. And I was actually <clears throat> quite shocked about this. Now, just as some background for this, my father's from Trinidad, um, and he came to England in the fifties. And we had pets mm. when we were kids in Leeds. We had pets. Everybody had pets: dogs, Alsatians, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Certainly in the area where we lived, and. Uh, if a dog became ill, generally we would, you know, it would, you know, if it had an injury yeah. and it clearly could, rather than actually spending any money to cure it, we'd just have it put down. Mm. If a hamster became ill, we'd probably just, and I, I, I'm sure our listeners won't respond well here, but you wouldn't necessarily <laughs> treat it, you'd just leave it in the cage until it died mm. or something like that. And it, anyhow, so we hardly spent anything on vet's bills, except mm. if you had a particularly large animal, it might have to be put down. Mm. Uh, but I wouldn't, if a hamster of mine when I was a kid, or even now, had a problem with its tooth, I wouldn't even consider taking it to the vet. Yeah. Different time, different people. So when you was a kid, I'm presuming money was tight and your dad would not have wasted money on, on no a pet. Way. Because he no was way. No way. He'd look he would be nervous about going to the vet. Exactly. Of the vets, yeah. yeah, yeah, he'd look to pay the vent. You know, it could, you know the, the, the other things to spend money on. But today we have lots of people have lots of disposable income. The main problem after that really is the lack of children we have. Pets have become child substitutes. Mm. Um, we see, you know, in when we were kids, people would have two, three, four, five children. Yeah. Now you're lucky to have one or two children. Lots of people don't have children. Dogs, cats, pets become their children. They're given names, look after them. They hug them. Vets. It's harder to become a vet than it is a doctor. Mm. Because to get on a vet training course at university requires higher qualifications to become yeah. a doctor. Yeah. Because you make more money as a vet. And certain vets do anyway. Um, that's part of the problem. Um, they become members of our family. And £500, I mean... I won't name him, a friend of mine, um, had no money, skin, bothered £1,500 to have her dog's ears drained. £1,500? And she had, she had no money, she had to bother the money to have her dog's ears but, drained. But, but this... Two years later, she had it put down. This flies in the <laughs> face of you saying people have got more disposable income because she didn't have disposable income. People she got the money off did. 
Ah. And she didn't have any children. That was her baby. Yeah. She called it her baby. Yeah. She cried when the dog cried. It was her baby. Do dogs cry? It makes a noise. I'm not sure you cry. But anyway, that that is a huge part of the problem. And in this country, we love animals. Well, many people love animals. I got told that I wrote about this in one of my books. This is a true story. Um, I won't name the people to protect the guilty. Um, no, name them. <laughs> family dog is ill. <clears throat> The mum, dad, two, three kids, got no money to take it to the vet. So took it to the vet. It was something like £1,500 for this operation. Couldn't afford it. Started a fundraiser online. £1,500 to get our dog. They put lots of pictures of the kids playing with the dog on the fundraiser. Um, and they raised £3,500. Um, at that point, I'm going, fair enough. If you want to give your money to save someone else's dog, it's your money. Mm. They didn't lie to you. This is where it goes wrong. <laughs> so one of their neighbours or one of their friends finds out what they're doing and says to them, there's a vet around the corners which is subsidised by a charity. And if you're on benefits and take your dog there, they will do the operation at a fraction of the price. Uh, um, they said, we're not on benefits. Uh, well, I am. I'll take your dog uh, in as my dog, dog yeah, in. Yeah. Took it in, booked in the operation, and it cost, it cost let's say, 150 quid. It was something right. like that. Yeah. Um, two days later, the family went to the travel agents and booked a family holiday to Disney World. With the three and a half grand? With the three and a half grand. That was... Was this somebody within your family? No, this so, was... So, somebody you know? The, the, this was a story of somebody who I know was told this about somebody else. Oh, right, okay. But I did a bit of digging and it's all true. Um, and what happened? That was it. They, they, they went. Nobody. So that went from stupid people giving stupid people money yeah. to fix their dog to criminal. To fraud, yeah. So up to that point, I yeah. didn't care. Once that happened, what the pers- people should have done, we raised three and a half grand, great. Get our dog fixed and now we donate. Anything left over, give we it donate. Back. or give it back. We, but it's hard to give back but we'll donate it now to the to the vets who do stuff for free for poor people for that's them. what they should have done that's what they should have done yeah. no they took a family holiday to Disney World on it they're just horrible people yeah but I thought but I thought about it in the book I, I thought about what what makes people do this they started off with the best intentions yeah because they were going to spend the money on the dog but after they raised the money and got a dog fixed what happens then is all those people didn't need that money because if they needed the money, they wouldn't have given us because I wouldn't give my money anybody. Oh, this is them rationalising. Ma- yeah, yeah. They're just they're either rich or they're stupid. They didn't want the money. That's why they gave it to us. So how I spend it now doesn't really affect them because they've already given that money away. I'm not now taking the money off them. Yeah. So they rationalise it themselves, and that is and that's what happens when you offer people stuff for free. We will, the humans will abuse the situation. Yeah. You look at our benefit system as a great example of how we'll abuse the system to our own benefit. That's not everybody, but it's the majority of people. Mm. That's an interesting story. And I know that people remain anonymous, but I'm, I'm sure you won't do that again, Nick. So that's... Uh... <laughs> I wouldn't have a dog. I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy food for a dog. Do you remember the... But when we <laughs> were kids, do you remember the PDSA? Because they were free treatment. Do you, PDSA, do you mm. remember that? We never had animals, so I don't know. And I remember in Leeds, it was the PDSA, and you could take your animal there for free. That's obviously gone away then. Well, they're charities now. So yeah. there's lots of charities. Maybe there charities. are where you can actually get your animal treated for free. Yeah, I, I don't think it's completely free. I think you've got to pay a little bit. Yeah, so, so um, I would probably do that then. I'd just go somewhere and pretend I was on benefits. You've got to prove you're on benefits. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, bang goes that theory. Uh, the last item... But they wouldn't treat your wife. You couldn't say she's a great dame. <laughs> she's not cold. <laughs> the last... I hope we can cut that bit out. Uh, <laughs> the, the last bit uh, section in this uh, this episode, uh, Nick. This is this is quite sinister, I think, uh, and it's um, a recruitment firm in London who employs and finds lawyers for the major city law firms has recommended to the major law firms in the city that they stop having heart. You know, your heart stops here when you hear this. Stop having socials. You know when typically in the professions, 
the end of a long day. Certainly in London, far more than yeah. I know you're, you're not that familiar with London life, but in London, most of the professions head out to the pub in the evening during the week, unlike mm. in Manchester, during the week, <coughs> head to the pub, have a drink, catch up, you know, yeah. relax or whatever. So they've advised their law firms that you need to stop having socials at the pubs because you're alienating and disenfranchising any Muslims mm. who may work for you. This is not a new thing. Really? Yeah, I remember this when I worked for Manchester Council 20 years ago. Really? And yeah, it wasn't as strict as that, you know, but there was discussions and there was people saying, I don't want to go on the Christmas do, um, A, because it's Christmas, and B, you're having it in a pub. Um, so these conversations were happening 20 years ago. Things have got worse since then. Um, this is pandering to an identity group. This is pandering to people who are Muslim, who think it's an issue going to a pub. It's not an issue going to a pub if you're a Muslim. It's an issue for you sat in a pub drinking alcohol. That's the issue. Yeah. Don't drink alcohol. Yeah. What happens if we go to a restaurant that doesn't serve alcohol but serves pork? I'm sure you don't want to go there either. What about if we, ha if we go to Dunkin' Donuts for our get-together on a Friday? Oh, what about the fat woman? She's be tempted now with with her cholesterol. Da, da, da. She doesn't want to go. That's not how am I going to Dunkin' Donuts and I can't have donuts. Yeah, but the argument there, I'm, I'm taking the side of the <clears throat> of arguing for this now. Uh, by the way, I'm not yeah. saying I agree. With it. The argument there is being fat is not a religion. Being a Muslim is a religion. It's a <clears throat> fundamentally held belief of a group of people, and forcing them or asking them to go to an environment where there's alcohol. Is inappropriate that's why they're saying the it. quran mentions nothing about being in an environment with alcohol the quran talks about you not consuming alcohol because it messes your brain and you can't think clearly that's what the quran says so going to a pub is quite it is is okay for muslims you're just not allowed to drink while yeah. you're there yeah um if we if you take this to the nth degree there's nowhere we can go yes so do we go to a, so one of my members staff's a vegetarian I mean, we can't go to beef. Yeah, but vegetarian now. is not religion. It's almost like a religion. Uh, yes, I suppose it is a belief system, isn't yeah. it? There can be a belief system yeah. about vegetarian. So then, so then, I would say, so I would say, so you're the you're the managing partner of a law firm. I'm saying, Nick, we can't go to the pub because we've got <coughs> uh, Muslims yeah. and, and it'll be offensive to them. Yeah. What's your answer to that? And say, so what? What? So what we're going to do for our social this year? I wouldn't change it. Yes, no, I, I, I wouldn't change it. We live... But what's your answer to me saying this is offensive to Muslims, the fact that the venue you've chosen, yeah. Nick, serves alcohol and everyone will be drinking yeah. alcohol and getting smashed, by the way? I say it's not offensive to Muslims, it's offensive for you as a Muslim. Because I can bring nine people into this room now who are Muslims, I haven't got a problem with it. So you've got a problem with it as a Muslim. It's not a Muslim problem. It's a you problem. I just like the idea you've got nine Muslims lined up outside your office. I have, and right. gays, and blacks, <laughs> and disabled people. Because you never know when you need them. You've got an office outside. Full, full of, of diversity, <laughs> full of that kids, I ever need them. Full of Muslims, black people, tra trannies, <laughs> gay people, and then any issues. I can bring a gay yeah. and you, 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 you basically pay yeah. them 50 grand a year each yeah. to come My in. My overheads are enormous. <laughs> they, come in, they come in and agree with you whatever yeah. subject you raise. Do you have a problem with yeah. that? No. You're gay, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. There you go. Yeah. That's my example. Yeah. So, and the reason is, if we let these people get away with that, where does it stop? So Hindu members of staff, I don't go to a restaurant that serves yes, beef. beef yeah. Because that's basically my God. Yeah, yeah. I We've got, you know, so you, there's lots and lots and lots. I mean, here's a good example. Um, in California, a town in California have just had all the road signs removed that says no U-turn. Because the local LGBTQ group said it's said it's homophobic, no U-turns. Why is that homophobic? I didn't want to read the rest of the article. <laughs> but that doesn't that mean you're then increasing <clears throat> danger on the road because people will be doing U-turns in an area where they're not supposed to do it. Yeah, that sign must be there for a reason. No U-turns. No U-turns. That's homophobic. Oh, is oh because it's I think it's uh, trans transphobic, is it or homophobic? I think they said homophobic. It loves some. I can guess what it, it loves, means. No U turns going back to being straight or, or stuff or, like or that. Or non or, yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be a silly reason. Yeah. But the council in this town 
top down all the no U-turn signs because some gay people, trans people, whoever said, I find that offensive. Mm. There's lots of things I find offensive. If we could stop things that were offensive, I'll tell you what, this country will change. It won't be a nice place, this country. It'll be nice for me. It won't be nice for anybody else. So, uh, with that, Nick Buckley, MB, <laughs> uh, parliamentary candidate for um, Oldham East yeah. and Saddleworth, who's just told us now there'll be no U-turns <laughs> around his policies. Uh, the best of luck on the 4th of July. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you like that video? I think you did. Hit the bell, give it a big thumbs up, comment, and don't forget, I'm standing for election in Oldham East and Saddleworth. So please share this video, speak to your family and friends if you live in Greater Manchester, and if you live in Oldham East and Saddleworth, make sure you vote for me. Catch you soon.